a while ago, I, I was telling them, or, or these guys, uh, Chike and Eric, that we are at, all of us are actually like high class prostitutes. Uh. <laughs> Welcome back, everyone, to episode seven of the Backholder Pod. So, today we actually have a special guest with us. So, um, it's still a four man team because Bunti is happily um, traveling and he's not with us um, for this time around. So, today we have Josh Tan, I think, um, from the Astute Parent. So, he also run a YouTube channel himself and he has gathered quite a big following. So, Josh Tan, how have you been? Hey, I'm okay. I'm okay. Came back from uh, traveling. So, Bunti now traveling. He's yeah, doing yeah. the right thing. So, hey, let's go and travel a bit more, end of the year. Right. And y'all can, I, I think we will try to um, try our best to still film an episode together. But um, if not, we'll try to get um, special guest appearances on our, um, with our limited connections, of course. But yeah, I do hope that you guys continue supporting and smashing the like button. Definitely don't forget about that. But anyway, I think um, this time around, uh, similarly, just cheeking Eric, Kelvin, and Josh with us. So I think the first topic of today's concern really is around um, the recent announcement around inflation and also the 50 basis points hike by the Federal Reserve. So just to get um, the discussion going, maybe Josh, you want to share your own opinions on the whole um, um, developments thus far in the markets? I'm trying to stay as far as I can from this whole big turmoil going on. Uh, it's it's very interesting. Things are shaking up quite a lot. We see Nasdaq climbing and then plunging. Uh, but I guess the best suggestion is just to you know see things longer term. Lah. It's very hard to predict. So as much as I'm also following it, I'm also trying to distance myself from all the excitement. What do you guys think of uh, the recent developments? Yeah, I was actually expecting that the market to go up after the announcement, but it went down. Uh, and, and I'm not surprised because it's still in the downtrend channel that I've been talking about. So, yeah. <laughs> oh, 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 yeah, yeah. And Tesla went down quite a lot, which also was within my prediction. Uh. Yeah. I think maybe I'll get Eric to comment because Eric tend to be the more on the more bullish stance, right? Um, amongst the four of us. Yeah. Actually, I had a bet with Punti saying that QQQ will reach like 330. But I think he's going to win this one. Oh, maybe I can jump in while I'm trying to stay far, far away because it's hard to predict. Right? It's like 50% right, 50% wrong. Uh, in terms of market direction guessing, right? Uh, or maybe just pick on things that we really wanted to buy. Lo. That if they come down, then buy. If not guessing the markets, oh, it's really hard. Seems like we are getting it right and wrong and uh, it's just going to even out over time. Uh, Actually, Josh, you continue yeah. sticking to your DCA or are you doing enhanced DCA this time around? Like, are you doing like your Chinese tech, the 2000-2000 additional per week? Oh yeah, I thought about Chinese tech, but I think China is in a different phase. Leh. It's been like super bearish for way too long. And the concerns about China is quite clearly different from general tech because general tech is all about this interest rate sentiment. Right? China yeah. is more about political risk and stuff. So I, I, I see them different. Uh, but I will be making plans to do bigger this year in 2023. That's that's in the pipelines. Okay. You, you that, recently you made a video about like uh buying into REITs, right? Like the five hmm. REITs you were talking about, like Maple Tree Industrial, Parkway Live, uh, like the five REITs, uh, Suntech ah. and two other REITs. Is is that your plan for next year or were you talking about like starting now? I, I, I made that video to suggest what I think is good. Like, doesn't mean it's a recommendation. But yes, I did pick up somebody from within that list. But I don't like to disclose <laughs> exact mm -hmm. details. But someone within the list I bought. That is true, that's true. As I remembered, in lump sum. Oh, wow, okay. Late, later, DM, DM. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's by yeah. recommendation of public. Oh, like. uh, yeah, true that. <laughs> Right. Then for Kelvin, have you been buying also in the yeah, just the usual like 1-2k DCA into Apple? Yesterday Apple dropped by quite a bit. No idea why. <laughs> so I just bought, bought a bit more. No? Right. Then for Eric, also just you you have been holding cash, right? Or you have been holding Yeah, it? actually I'm 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 storing up cash to actually buy a new property, a resale HDB. La. So that's why I'm very interested to ask Josh later about the HDB once we are done with our usual topic yeah I want to get his opinions uh, his data points yeah right okay so I think also to move on um, on a more similar note right 
I think yesterday the market hasn't been very kind to us. I think big tech on across the board was down at least three to five percent. I think there, there's a sparkling light though. There is this very interesting green patch um in the whole um uh how do I put it in the whole heat map? It's actually Tesla. So I think Tesla actually closed green yesterday. So I just wanted to get like the two big Tesla bulls, right? Like what the heck is going on? Can you guys let us know what's happening over at Twitter, Elon Musk? Elon Musk selling and the whole shenanigans going on there. Alvin, do you sell? Were you the one? <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't sell. You didn't sell. Okay, yeah. That's, that's good. Not yet. Okay, but anyway, why Tesla was green was because uh, Monday to Wednesday, Elon Musk was selling, right? He, he's, the, he's the guy that dumped like how many shares? 20 million shares, right? On the market. Uh, although they say it's like only about what 5% or something like that uh, of the whole day's turnover, but I thought it was quite a significant selling pressure. Yeah, when, when I saw the, the price drop so much on a green day, right? Like heat map, everything is green except Tesla was down like 2-3%. I somehow got the feel that it's probably Elon because he, he will say, oh, uh, I will make sure Tesla shareholders benefit in the long term. If he said things like that, right? He's very sure that he's selling on the site. Uh, I, I'm like, that, that's why I type in the group chat, uh, in the Tesla group. Sure enough, it's him. Uh. So uh, I think after dropping for three days consecutively, so so poorly, I think uh, market is quite relieved that, okay, so probably it was Elon and not the institution selling. That's why we managed to eke out a slight green. Yeah, but there's nothing to celebrate, I, I, I feel. I don't know how Kelvin do you think is <laughs> is, a, is it a win? Uh actually I don't really care about Tesla in the short term. La. Like, wow. like I, a while ago I made that video, like why I'm bearish about Tesla in the short term. Then I then many people hated me for that video. I said, hey, hey, how come you are bearish now? You are on the bear camp now, are you are this toxic bear? <laughs> but but even with my bearish projection, I've I've uh, estimated that by 2030 it will be at a higher price like considering that uh, Fusia driving is not there they are not selling that much cars there are a lot of competition but the, the price is still a lot higher than the current uh, current price so that so right now I'm not that worried la. though, though I, I, I do understand why people feel very sad right now like Elon is running away from them right? he's not their god anymore they, they kind of feel but uh, what about Justin? Uh, the last time you say that Tesla is cheap, now it's actually cheaper. Eh? Are, you, are you starting to much? Hey, don't drag me into the toxic bear uh, discussion. <laughs> I don't like it. Uh, but I think Elon is paid a lot in share options, right? Which means if he needs money, he does need to sell. So his stake builds up, he sells down. Uh, I, I think net-net, yeah, he, he just needs money for his reasons or what. That part I also don't quite uh, you know, know his personal books like, in that sense. And speaking about dumping on retail, right, there's this new development recently that the SEC just filed um, uh, several charges to a few of the big Twitter accounts out there. So I think most of them actually have um, followers of the north of around 100 to 300,000 followers. And um, it was during a very specific time frame, particularly after COVID lockdowns, and there was this meme stock saga where many of them essentially engaged in a pump and dump scheme. So long story short, a pump and dump scheme means that um, some of these big creators come together, um, they identify a few stocks, um, usually penny stocks, and they go in and then they buy those stocks first. And then they release the news that, hey, this is the 10, next 10x opportunity. Their followers all congregate, they buy up the stock, and then um, that's when the influencers sell out and they profit the in-between. And I'm quite sure most of them make quite a big fortune of that. And I think right now, um, SEC is launching an investigation on, um, I think, eight Twitter handles or eight of these individuals um, trying to find them for around $100 million, if I'm not wrong, um, based on their current disclosures. So I think we actually did discuss about this um, Finfluencer topic um, in great extent in a few of our previous episodes. So since Josh is here, I wanted to get your, your take on this idea on um, Finfluencers like promoting stocks and um, expressing, showing our portfolio online and, and pumping stocks, etc. Like what's your general... Um... I, I saw the news on this uh, SEC filing and I was quite annoyed actually. Because uh, as usual, we know these pump and dump schemes, right? Step one is they... They look for something that they can manipulate. 
that's the that's the first step. What you cannot manipulate Tesla shares unless you are Elon Musk. So they identify it, and then step two is they purchase it before release releasing, you know, news that may seem favorable. Then they start promoting it on their podcast, their own Twitter handle, especially when there's traction. So you see, right? Once there's traction, then they can promote it even more because hey, got results. What right? I'm making ten x, two x, whatever that number is. Uh, then it plays on greed actually on their followers uh, before the eventually dump it. So look at the whole story, right? This whole scheme of pump and dump, I think it's it's wrong. It's it's really fraud. It's really exploitation, if we put it to very core words. Uh, you know, fin uh, influencers are like any influencers. It can be Kim Kardashian. It can be something else. Uh, but, you know, we, we build trust with our audience. And when we exploit that trust, right, it's, it's predatory. Right? Like we are preying on that trust. And I think the intention is wrong. So that's why I saw this kind of news. I, I, I felt this needs to be called out. This needs to be punished. Uh, it's, it's different from us, you know, mentioning trust bank. Uh, like, I'll use trust bank, you get referral code. That's different. Uh, this is them preying on and building up their greed in their, in their community and then preying on it. So I think it's wrong. Uh, then with that, I'll also ask a question. Is there like a scenario whereby we all as influencers also start to think, hey, should we exploit our, our audiences? Is there a price that's too big? Because it's a sticky topic. Once big money is thrown, right? Or once we imagine we can make big money, right? Would it tilt our moral compass? No? So <laughs> difficult question. Anyone wants to jump in on it? I think it should be directed Kelvin. to Kelvin first. Kelvin. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, a while ago, I, I was telling them, or, or these guys, uh, Chike and Eric, that we are at, all of us are actually like high-class prostitutes. Uh. <laughs> And, and I think like... L- luckily, I didn't hear You need that. to explain. I get angry so, okay, okay. To explain. so the explanation is like, um, there's, as long as the price is right, right? You are, you are willing to do certain things. La. So I think... For, I object, but okay, continue <laughs> first. So I, I think like for me, uh, okay, for, for my channel, I, I am valuing like, like my, my reputation at a very, very hmm. high value. Like in a... If if I will be to be very like, uh, like on self praise on self like, in the in the billions like. So unless you can afford op- offer me that kind of value, right? There's no way I would like sell sell my soul <laughs> to to like to earn this kind of money like. So and Mr. Beast was like offered a billion dollars, right? I thought I saw something. <clears throat> correct. Oh, like, so but that's just to sell the company, not to promote yeah, something. Then scary. he valued his company at a much higher price. I think like a, a few times more than a few billion. Like. So that's why he didn't want to sell. The, so for me, like I intend to take this channel much further. Like, and I think the impact is much higher uh, than just <laughs> selling up for that few hundred thousand like. dollars. To me, it's, I, don't, I don't think it's, it's worth it. Like. Uh, unless you can offer me a few, a few like 10, 20 billion dollars. Ah. <laughs> In that case, I might consider, right? Because it's I, life-changing money. Right? I, I, guess, I guess we impact a lot of people who right. come in and watch some things we see and maybe model our trajectory. And uh, I, I, I want like, to add on, even if offer a billion dollars, I think like as long as the value you can provide, right? Mm. As long as you are able to provide a value, right? Eventually, the money will come by itself mm. even without taking that sponsorship money or without selling out. Like you, if you see like, okay, Jeff, all the rich people in the world, like, they are doing something that has changed the world, all the billionaires, like, like Tesla, uh, Amazon, Microsoft. So they actually don't have to sell out. As long as they sell something that's useful to the people, the money will eventually come in already. Yes, actually, uh, I, wanted to, yeah. I wanted to go against this a little bit and push back, right? So, I mean, as of now, uh, the three of us all took a certain level of sponsorships from brokerage firms that I wouldn't mention names here because... In future, if they want to sponsor us, maybe they, they will turn away. But I think that that's besides the point. I I think more importantly, the the, the recent saga, especially in the, the FTX thing. So this FTX implosion, um, it brought down a lot of the big YouTube creators out there that took and and it was exposed that it's in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. So for a one month contract, it's in six digits, six figures. So then here comes the issue. We 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 did we we plant our flag here and we say that okay, we value our reputation to X dollar amount or like we we treat we treat our influence very seriously. Okay, that I agree. But then it's also true that on the other hand, on on the side, 
we we do a certain level of due diligence. We take a, a certain level of sponsorships from this different brokerage platform. Touch wood. I touch a lot, a lot of wood. One day, one of our sponsors also go under. I don't know how and why, but one day, if it really goes under, then how do we value or, or how do we how do we put a full stop to that discussion? Um, I, th- I think I can jump on jump in on that uh, topic. Uh, right. Firstly, the pump and dump is absolutely different from accepting a sponsorship, Agree. even if it's FTX, because the intention is different. The pump and dump, the intention is to, to prey on that influence. Right. Uh, then as to the point, if we represent something that goes under, like X- FTX, for example, uh, I'll think that the best outcome is to is to repay that sponsorship earn. I think that's what I'll do if, if I were facing this situation. If I was paid 100000 then I think that cannot be earned. That in its crux, right, must be properly earned. If that platform has created fraud, then that money cannot be earned. It should be returned. It should be donated. That's that's how I would try to react uh, and uh, unravel that injustice. If I take this money, uh, okay, yeah. you know that in, in Singapore, a few months ago, there's this crypto lending platform that collapsed because the CEO was doing funny stuff behind our backs. I'm, right now, I'm wondering like, how can he show his face in Singapore? How, how would he dare to show his face in Singapore and not getting backlash? That's the thing that I'm, that I'm wondering about. So if I were to take Fly this to money... Bali. Huh? <laughs> Fly to Bali. Uh, but anywhere you go, like, you will be hated already. Yeah, like that's, that, your name is very sucky. Right? So if I were to take this money, I, my, my main concern is always like how to help people, not how to get rich myself. Like. Getting rich is, is not a problem for me already, to be very honest. <laughs> to be very honest. I, I know a lot of ways to get rich. Like, and cheating people out of this money is, is not one of them because that that's there's a price to pay. But if you are doing it, uh doing the correct way, uh, like teaching people on YouTube, this kind of stuff. Uh I think that's karma. <laughs> as long as you do bad things, the but, karma. But why karma. why do you say like uh I think the way that you're saying it is like you for sure you know that that one is a is a fraud. But what if it is a legit company like uh or the North or or whatnot, that's quite legit. Like, I mean, at that point in time, nobody thought that, you know, uh, there's something wrong with the company. Everyone honestly thinks it's okay. And then if they really sincerely approach you, can you help to like spread awareness for our brand? Because we are a local company, support local. Ma. So, I mean, you are, by right, you're helping people also. Ma. So, th- so, so that's, that's what I did this year, right? And that was the mistake that I did because I did not consider the fact that they are not regulated. I, I, I did consider that. La. I did ask them. La. Then they lied to me. <laughs> oh, so, so I think like, so, so I made a decision like if I were to promote something, right, it has to be regulated in some way, mm. like, like brokerage platforms. So even if they like, right, there's a uh, backup plans for brokerage platforms is uh, they are, Insured by SIPC, they are they are custodized. The our, our assets are custodized, not custodized with them, something like that. Right. I think maybe just to close off this entire discussion, right? Um, there is a very key part of the discussion, is more of like intention. I think like Josh actually mentioned previously, we can do all the DD of the world. Um, you still can pick the wrong stocks, you can still can invest in the wrong company, and you'll pick the wrong sponsorships. I think at least for now, um, let's hope that things come to a conclusion like uh, it, it ends off ends off well and, and those people can get some sort of justice back but I think if not moving forward um, we just have to tread more carefully and I think just to poke again a 20% APY if you have any finance knowledge is a little bit unsustainable in the long term I think I just wanted to it, sometimes if it's too good to be true if it walks like a duck quacks like a duck and it looks like a duck it, it's probably a duck so that, that's that I think, Maybe I throw in the last point. Sure. Uh, yeah, so hopefully this, this uh, whole SEC investigation creates you know, more pressure to do the right things because like, influencing is very wide. We're in the finance space, but influencers exist in other me- social media platforms also. So hopefully this creates more pressure for each and every influencer in every space to think a bit more carefully uh, on what they want to promote and collaborate and any schemes to avoid such as Palm and Dump don't prey on their audiences in any space. Right. Thanks, Josh. I think also to maybe circle back, 
Um, Eric actually has a very personal question. I think he's quite interested in the entire property market. So maybe Eric, you know, shoot off your question. Oh, it's my turn. Okay. Uh, I want to ask Josh, right? Because uh, I've been watching your video. You were, you were saying that you're selling off your investment property. And I think you already sold, according to Chiking. Uh, so I'm just interested because I'm on the lookout for like a resale HDB. Uh, so I understand that you are bearish on the on the property market like this next year uh so you you say that it will be turning bearish soon so i'm quite keen to know what are your your data that you have looked into to to come to this uh conclusion i think warren buffett has a saying like you know uh, a forecast says more about the forecaster than the forecast itself and uh, obviously with my selling on my hdb flat i I'm obviously on the bearish side. So disclaimer first also. But Eric, this this is gonna be your first house or investment property. What was the what's the background? No, actually I'm upgrading to a bigger one. I'm oh. now staying in a three-bedroom. Uh so I want to buy like a, at least a five-bedroom resale. Okay, so it's home la, if if I were yeah, to it's a, it's guess a the situation. I, I think for home wise, or it's it's always based on needs. I said we need roof over our head, we need space for the family and stuff. Uh it in my approach now is selling away the one which I'm renting. Home, this one over here is untouched because mm -hmm. you know we tie a lot of our lives to home. Uh, but for investment property, it becomes, you know, we need to make investment decisions. Uh it cannot be weight the same as home. Like home we like the environment. Whereas investment property is really numbers. If you think that uh the real return is no longer be good or negative, then what is the step to take so home wise i would still encourage that if you want to upgrade then the only question is prudency and uh you know finding that right step like uh, getting nearer to the next place school whatever cases parents home uh, then that one takes more precedence than my guess on the market direction because i could be wrong also so that's that's the reality of things i know but i'm, I'm still interested to know why you, are you bearish i'm <laughs> sorry the 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 punter in me <laughs> needs to know <laughs> I um maybe we see big picture sentiment wise first. You mm. see, right? in in my circle of friends, I see everyone upgrading. Mm. Two million dollar property very common. The upgrading leg suggests there is a lot of uh greed la, or a lot of optimism. Maybe to put it more bluntly, and a lot of times when we see the sentiment tilting too much to one side, I think uh that that shows on shows on records whether you be on the contrarian side, it pays off or not for investment wise investment property. A lot of people are doing uh, sell HDB and buy two properties already. So, so I think that's run a lot of legs. Uh, but then, now coupling with interest costs, uh, I do advisory work. I see the books and it is going to get glaring in terms of affording that loan. Some people are going to get TOP next year. Uh, they, what they saw in terms of purchasing when they were at a showroom is going to be very different from what they're actually paying. So I think it'll be a root shock uh, for 2023 in terms of ownership cost. And that should sour sentiment uh, if if things play out on this trajectory. So I'm I'm just moving ahead of time. Because you know, when it comes when it comes to selling property, right, you need to sell on a high cycle. So mm -hmm. in a low cycle, very difficult to sell. <laughs> you realize. Yeah. Uh, uh, I actually bought this property, it was listed 1.33. I offered 1.15 only. I undercut by 180,000. Closure 1.18. So you see uh, on the down cycle in 2006, 2016, 2017, people will lowball you and the offers are just lousy. Whereas on the flip side, on a high cycle, right, <clears throat> you realize people are bidding or uh, cash over valuation, cash over yeah. valuation. The bidding part comes in. You Property agent will tell us, oh, there's competition, somebody will offer. That's the up cycle. In the up cycle, it's much easier to sell. That's why I'm, I'm making moves in this up cycle. Whether it's the final leg or not, I have no clue. So, so uh, by boys, but if you're upgrading, then prudency and Fits your needs. I think that that is more important uh, than the overall market direction. Actually, I'm 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 quite interested. What for Josh, right? What how are you deploying the capital? Are you keeping the capital for now? Capital like, not um, in yet, leh. So uh, how are you going to? We can only have to fancy thoughts where to right. deploy that capital. Capital not in yet. It should come uh second quarter, because you know transaction is slow. So ah, uh, so uh, right. you can have time to buy your house. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> But how are you intending to move the money though? Or oh yes, you... uh, equity markets, 100%. I am advocating against uh, fixed deposits, T-bills. I think markets will reward us big time 
once we get past this hard phase, lah. So you should expect me to deploy into equity markets. If you are able to share on this podcast first, um, what <laughs> specific sector or geography <laughs> or? <laughs> it's just uh, I I realize uh, there's not pressure when we give too much details. There's embarrassment. Right. We 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 have a bit more hesitance to change our mind, lah. So to answer that, I'll probably give big picture again. Uh, buy things that I like, and if the quantum is big, then it has to be broader base. Ah, uh, then okay. then it's hard because when we pick individual stocks, if I pump that four hundred k to one stock, then again I need to rethink: Am I op- overly optimistic on one particular company? Is it too much of a weight? Ah, uh, so if the quantum is big, then I'll space it out, which means indexing or diversify approach. Then yes, I should be picking up things that I like in a smaller quantity. Understand. Then I wanted to pick on the topic where the I I think I've been following your channel for very long. So you have you have been also advocating that I think back in 2021 or even start of this year that you were talking about this idea of uh unraveling of big tech, right? So you are pretty bearish on many of these big tech names like Amazon, Apple, Microsoft. Well, on the other side of the trade, actually Kelvin has been dollar cost averaging into a lot of these big tech names. So I wanted to see like uh do do you think we are kind of Trying to form a bottom now, or do you think there's still a lot? Yeah, I'll be on Kevin's side. <laughs> <laughs> so you are now. Kevin, you go first. Kevin, you go first. Oh, okay. Uh, for for me, I because I'm a programmer, ma, I'm more uh familiar with tech stuff. So that's why I'm just investing in it. I, I though I do believe that tech is overvalued now. Long term wise, I'm 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 still quite bullish like, like same 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 as Tesla because like. That's because of how big the mood is right now for them, like for Amazon and Microsoft, Tesla. So, so unless I see something else overtake them, I right now I'm not that worried right now. Lord. So, and all this is just part of my strategy to just diversify uh, out of Tesla, not by selling Tesla, to just to diversify out by allo- reducing my allocation on Tesla by diversifying, diversifying out. Once I've achieved that, I will start that was defined into more broad-based market stuff like SMB, QQQ, this kind of stuff. Lor. Summary, I, I still believe that it can go down more. Long-term wise, I believe this, this downtrend is just a short-term thing. Lor. Maybe I can pick up on that also. Uh, so on, on the flip side, yeah, 2021, I, I did mention, already I've been way too early in uh, calling tech overvalued. So of course, 2020 looks silly. But 2021 is, is a good highlight that uh, sentiment is super optimistic already. The wave up has been prolonged already. Consensus is unanimous that tech would take over the world and stuff. Uh, but for this year, or, or rather, what we can learn from this whole cycle is that on hindsight, this 0% interest environment that we had from global financial crisis onwards, although it did inch up a bit, but generally it's still 0%, 1%, 2%, low interest environment. The biggest beneficiary, looking on hindsight, is Quite obviously, not energy, not banking, uh, not industrials, but tech. So tech, when we look back in history, right, 20 years later, we look back at this phase, we, we can quite clearly identify that tech is the biggest beneficiary. Uh, we can also say that residential property maybe also benefited. Uh. Residential property leverage on low cost for borrowing. Tech leverage on low cost to scale. That's why we can see a lot of scaling of uh, companies that were not profitable. But I guess that the game is gone really like. Uh, I have concerns uh, on whether this could further spiral downwards. Uh, that's why I'm still not too optimistic. I think the, the compression of uh, price and interest ratio can still run a lot more, in my personal opinion. Uh. Josh, but, uh, but what about long term? Do you see this to continue stay low? I, I guess the long term part is, it, we, we kind of, we kind of, uh, how does it get, get swayed by recent trends a bit. The, the long term part is hard to hard to nail down also. Because as, asking any dot-com investor in 2001, they would have also been thinking, okay, I'll invest long term in Microsoft. It'll be fine. But it took until 2007 to break even. Eh. Then the journey is hard. The expectation that it will recover in one, two years became six years. So sometimes it's, it's really hard to nail down that we are confirmed long term. Uh, but but rather, if we size our investment correctly, we thought through, we, we bought it slowly, and then we are aligning our buying stage with the intention of holding long-term. 
So I think that there are, there are things that tie together if we are serious about the long-term aspect. Uh, that's my opinion. Every time when I hear Josh speak, right, I'll just like, at, at first I'll have a narrative in my mind. Then when he speaks, finish I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow, he said correct. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I think that's a very good, that's a very good skill He's set. He's a too. very good influencer. Yeah. <laughs> you can but, change but, your mind. Right. But I mean, just, just to share my own perspective, right? Um, many of these corrections downwards are in the north of like 50, 60, 70%. I'm not talking about like the big ones that are still holding. So Apple and Microsoft are still holding, but the rest of them basically collapse like nobody's business really. So I think it was more than 50%. So as long as you are buying, like you didn't help at the top or you didn't enter at the top, as long as you are starting to accumulate here, I don't think it's a very bad price per se. Uh, because it's always it's definitely hindsight. It's all, definitely better than when you accumulated in 2021. But I think recently I read this memo from Howard Marks. Right, I think Sea Change was the title of the memo, and he was also kind of hinting to the perspective that hey, the last decade might not be similar to the next decade. Talking about this kind of low interest rate environment. But then again, the other side of me or the skeptic, the skeptical side of me, jump out and say that hey. Don't fall into the trap that saying that this time is different because we all like to think that this time is different, right? So then it's it's still a battle. Uh, I still haven't have a very strong opinion on this, but um, as long as you, I mean, for those of you who passively invest and index, then just continue indexing. For those of you who like to pick companies, then um, just make sure that you're picking right companies. I, I think um, I, I, I honestly don't have greater insights because I'm not better than God here. So uh, that, that's just my own my my own um, ideology on how I invest moving forward. But yeah, I think for Kelvin, um, are you swayed by Josh? <laughs> are you are you st- stopping your DCA? No, no, don't stop DCA. <laughs> I, 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 don't, don't say that I stop, say stop DCA. <laughs> In fact, I'm advocating on my channel to start DCA two zero two three, regardless of uh, the all the bad news, lah. So you believe DCA is not dead yet, lah? Confirm not. I, I I will stay on the side that you know DCA helps to remove that emotional part. Uh, yes, it could get lower. No, nobody knows for sure. But again, if we are all in the building up phase to retirement, then DCA is just a very uh, slow way. To remind yourself, okay, I go this path is to long term, and then I buy it slowly. Also, if I lump some whack, then then I'm not too sure. It's like you get married too quickly, kind of a feeling. Like in one shot, you you pump everything you have into the Nasdaq, and then that's different from you slowly buy, and then regardless of what it turns out in two zero two three, then you have an intention for ten years, and that that will fit. So like earlier this year, like at, at, at least for me, I can see that the the market will turn bad. Uh, due to all this interest rate, the war thing, inflation, that w- wouldn't it be like better to just time the market? Like buy it right now, <laughs> buy in December right now when everything is gone down by like 50%, uh, as, like Tesla, and, and not, not DC in, and, because you would then buy at a higher price. Ma. So like for next year, we all know that the Fed will continue raising rates. Uh, then there's a recession. Then the market could go even lower based on historical data like uh like i've checked like in during recessions right the market can go down like don't know how many 20 30 percent it wouldn't be better to wait like maybe two three months four months later then only start dca in i actually have one last question for josh uh i'm not sure whether have you done a video on it uh what's your views on commodity stocks now i i remember i think earlier in the year you were talking about commodity stocks uh, what's your view? Has it updated? Like, I, I heard that the commodities are like coming down quite quite a bit. Uh, right? The reason I'm doing less commodity videos because it doesn't trend well. It sucks, oh, the viewership. Okay. It's a very uh, unpopular topic. Uh, that, that's the fact of things. Uh, unless I'm speculating on something that conspiracy theory. If not, the whole story of co- commodities is just not getting eyeballs. Uh, which also re- re- reaffirms certain things to me that uh, it's still unloved. Mm-hmm. Uh, likely valuations are not excessive. I think it's quite easy to guess. It's not excessive. You know, we saw big oil at close to all-time high. I think it's easier to justify it's not excessive. Oh, I have one more question. <laughs> 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 uh, are you doing anything to hedge your portfolio now? Because like I saw Adam Kuhl saying that TLT is a good way to hedge. Are you doing something similar to that? I I, I don't... I don't 
advocate too much of hedging. Or rather, when I take portfolios over and see what, what can be undone, right? I see sometimes also uh, very complicated steps. One whole list of 50 stocks and then some uh, inverse ETFs coming. Uh, because hedging actually is taking the other side already. It, unless you are hedging something that is that's zero correlation. If you're hedging something that's negative correlation, technically it's already selling. That's that's in my opinion. Uh, I, I would much rather simplify it. You either bear with the losses uh, and don't need to hedge or if you think you are overexposed already. You, you, you have, you're getting concerned and then you need to string your position. That's feedback already. So rather than hedging, I think simplifying it might help. And it's the simpler message love, to most audience. Same, same. I'm doing Adam same. is in sophisticated trading, yeah. So uh, he has his strategies. I, I, I would have to. Right. Uh, my my perspective of hedging just means that you want to play both sides of the market, so that when you go up, you will win a lot. You go down, you will lose a lot. So you're just trying to minimize the. I mean, in 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 finance, like minimize the volatility, right? So that you you play in a much tighter range. But, uh, if I mean. I don't know, unless your portfolio is like in the millions, uh, if you try to squeeze the margins, I like like for myself, if I'm going to squeeze a $10,000 portfolio, I, I don't know why am I squeezing at the end of the day. So there's no point uh, if, if your portfolio is not, not big enough, especially because when I, you I, play. Maybe options. I can jump on that. I've, I've seen before like uh, uh, ownership of big tech stocks, Amazon, Apple, uh, Google, and then there's a short on NASDAQ. Effectively, it's a negative correlation already. Uh, so then technically it's, it's still a sell. Uh, there's, there's no there's no direction to it. Uh, it's, it's as good as selling. You'll get the same effect. So the hedging part is something that I think uh, complicates uh, an approach. I'm not too sure the benefits of it. Right. I think I think for that, like like you said, long big tech and short NASDAQ, uh, you kind of want to achieve a level of market neutrality. So it's like maybe 100% of your portfolio, you take 30% short NASDAQ. So you reduce your exposure by 70%. I mean, I do agree that it's, you're basically just selling 30% of your portfolio. But uh, I, I don't know what's the, the main intention behind it, but it feels very much to me like you just want to feel better or make your portfolio look greener. I don't know. That's just that's just my own 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 perspective. But I think just to end off this entire discussion, right? Because uh, I have a thumbnail in mind. I have a thumbnail where, where I'll put Josh's face and then we'll put like 1M easy like a uh, quote unquote one M easy. So no, just because this is also the end of the year. So we're actually approaching 2023, right? And I just wanted to get, so a lot of people will go, go into the new year, then they'll be like writing their new year resolution and okay, I'm committed to doing X, Y, and Z. So maybe from your perspective as like uh, experienced um, financial advisor and also a YouTuber and seeing so many experiences, right? Like what would your, how do I put it? What would your quote unquote um, advice be in 2023 for people that wants to strive towards that, that goal? I think there are, there are two parts that I can look back in 2022, learning points uh, that we can maybe bring forward to 2023. The first part is probably on the investment front. 2022 was you know uh, a year uh, that we can look in terms of growth at any price. We talk about a lot of growth investing, growth investing. I think growth at any price uh, is unveiling itself to be a very dangerous game to play. You no know, companies that are sexy, uh, talk on YouTube channel. Uh, I mean, I, I mean, constructively, uh, we see uh, Palantir, we see CrowdStrike, we see C, Grab, Block. These are tech firms that haven't turned serious profits yet. So I think that growth at any price phase is a, a, a lesson on looking back from the investment front. Then on the approach front, 2022, I think a lot of uh, optimism or punting for the bottom happened to take place in this period also. China Tech, I also increased my China allocation wrongly. So a lot of uh, punting for bottoms was, was a, a good reminder in terms of approach for 2022. So looking forward, uh, let's, let's not try to bring these errors moving forward. Uh, this year, slowly, consistently, don't get shaken too much by good news or bad news, regardless of what, what it, I think that would help. Uh, because we've seen 2022 with so much ups and downs, we, we kind of get swayed quickly to yet another side of the coin. And uh, hopefully we can all avoid some of the mistakes uh, and have a better 2023. Right. Thanks, Josh. I think maybe to just close off this entire discussion, I think uh, we didn't really develop the point of like, quote unquote, timing the market where Kelvin was suggesting just now, right? I think just uh, some historical perspective because 
I had an in-depth discussion with my dad as well. My dad was saying, this is exactly the same attitude that people were talking about, like amongst friends in coffee shops back during the 98, 2000 and 2008 crisis as well. So I hope you guys enjoyed the discussion. With that, we'll see you in the next video.